Good evening, I am Persilace. Thank you for tuning in to episode 13 of Love at First Scent on Facebook Live. I think we should start by smelling a perfume and I want to get straight into this one. Unfortunately, I can't show you the full bottle because um, I, I haven't got a sample of the full bottle here, because, but you can look up the full bottle online. This is very exciting because it is the latest release from Nila Vermeer Creations an independent brand that was set up a few years ago. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it. Founded by Nila Vermeer, it is named after her. All of her perfumes so far have been made uh, in collaboration with Bertrand Duchaufour. They've all been in some shape or form inspired by India. And this one is no exception. It is called, you can't actually see that here uh, because I think this is a sort of standard wrapper, but it's called Niral. Um, and I'm just going to get straight into into smelling it. I will say, as per usual, I will say all my hellos and welcomes and greetings um, after we've smelt the first perfume, because I think it's a good idea to just get straight into it with the first one. However, I have a confession to make. This one ex isn't exactly, uh, doesn't exactly qualify for the rules of love at first scent because I have smelt it before, but only very briefly and in an environment where I wasn't quite able to, to concentrate on it. Um, good evening, Vitali. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Do keep the comments coming, but let's get, let's get going with this now. This isn't, this isn't a spray vial. It's one of those sort of funny dab ones where, you, you, where you're sort of worried that you're gonna waste half of the precious substance. I can see that there's some going on there. Right, let me seal it up. How many of you are familiar with um, this brand? Fabian says, good evening from Germany. A very good evening to you as well. Thank you very much for tuning in. Right, let's pop that on there. Okay, Niral from Nila Vermeer on the blotter. Whoa, okay. Actually, and I hope I'm saying your name right. Jin Hui says hello from Paris. Good evening to you as well. I just need to make sure that on my tablet here, I've actually got you all because that's my only way of checking your comments. And Roger says, good afternoon from Boston. This is fantastic. So many people saying hello already. Is this a better time for you? I don't normally have four hellos um, within, within the first minute of of the broadcast. Anyway, back to this. So what was I saying? That it is relevant that I'm asking you, um, hi from London as well, Eglia, it, uh, it is relevant that I'm asking you whether you're familiar with this brand because you immediately get that really sophisticated and seductive Nila Vermeer signature. Her perfumes don't hold back in terms of their richness and this one seems to be so far anyway no exception this is one of the, this is one of these sort of perfumes that you dive into gladys says hi from chicago hello and ross says hi from clacton brilliant thank you for joining us from clacton as well um you you, you dive into Nila vermeer perfumes like they're these sort of you know they're they're pools of scent and they don't drown you, you know, they're not cloying, they're not overwhelming, and yet you would probably be quite happy to be drowned by, by them because they are so rich. I'm thinking particularly of Trai. Belinda says hello from Norway. Hello, I wish I could say hello in all of your different languages, but hello, Dobry wieczór to anybody uh, listening from uh, watching in Poland. Um, it, it, it is just, if you ever get a chance to smell a, a vintage version of Joy from Jean Patou, you you may understand what I mean when I say that some perfumes can be like a kind of carpet of scent, in the sense that they are thick and textured and you feel you could sink into them, but they also carry on forever and they give a, they, they give a space its shape. Um, and Nila Vermeer per perfumes are like that. And this one, starts off, see I'm, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed, I can't even sort of tell you what's in it. The, 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 the main note that is coming through, at this stage anyway, is iris. But 
may be inflected with um, a kind of violet-like sweetness. Nazik says, watching from Toronto. Um, so I guess, how many hours behind us would you be? Six hours or something like that? And you are wearing Poivre Samarcande. Well, look what we've got here. We've got an Hermesence that I might be talking about later. Thank you for joining us. Um, iris, maybe with kind of a, a sort of twist of sweet violet, certainly a lot of rose, and, and certainly that, that steamed milk Indian desserts feel that seems to be the signature for this brand. But, but I hasten to point out very, very quickly that that does not make this a, a gourmand. Um, it's not oversweet. If, if, if anything, the, the sandalwood is, is, is cutting through that. But it's just, it, it's just so sophisticated. I think that's, that's the thing with all of, with all of Neil of Vermeer's perfumes. Even something like Bombay, Bombay Bling, sorry, which is, which is supposed to be the, the fun side of the brand. It's supposed to be a little bit more irreverent. It's supposed to be a little bit more modern. It, 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 it can't help but convey a certain amount of sophistication, I guess, because Neela Vermeer herself is quite a sophisticated character, and, 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 and maybe it is those sides of her that Bertrand Duchaufour is able to draw out. You know, they sort of collaborate with each other quite well, and, and, and the, the work that they create is just very, very elegant, and it really does genuinely bridge that proverbial east-west gap. Um, lots of brands say that, that they do that kind of thing, you know, you bridge between east and west, etc. But Neely Vermeer actually does it. Um, in case you're interested, my favourites from the brand so far, I need to give Nero a proper test drive, um, my favourites are Trai, one of the debut trio, and also Ashoka, which I really, really love very much. And that, interestingly, is also an iris, but very different from this one. That's a sort of drier, maybe more meditative, more contemplative iris. This is this is iris that's dressed up absolutely to the nines in something red. I'm picturing a lot of red, a very, very rich, opulent red. But gosh, certainly first proper sniff away from that slightly more distracting environment in which I first smelt it. And it, this may well be another triumph for Neil Livermere. Now let's very quickly have a look at I'll get rid of the blue shirt wearing idiot on my screen. <laughs> and let's very quickly look at the press release, which I've also got on my tablet. So as it says here, Niral, which is a note of parfum, and the tagline, I suppose, that the brand has attached to the scent is Serene Silk Connections. A new year, a new chapter in the olfactory journey of Neela Vermeer. After our first six creations, we have now moved towards a new series of fragrances which still carry our signature. For our new creation, Nirol, we have redesigned our packaging, blending the purple colour of our mohair extra and our EDP flacon, etc, etc. So, the fragrance, Nirol, is a perfume, here we go, inspired by an interesting and unique relationship between British sericulture expert, author, print dyeing industrialist Sir Thomas Wardle, who lived mostly in the 19th century, in, according to this. So the relationship between him and India, celebrating his immense contribution to the promotion of Indian wild silk, uh, of the Indian wild silk trade from Bengal and Kashmir to Europe. Wardle's contribution may have been forgotten, but he influenced and collaborated with several great textile artists and silk printers of his generation, such as William Morris, Leon Victor Solon, and a number of influential artists from the art and craft movement. Wardle perfected the technique for natural dyeing of the textured Tusso silk, achieving stunning jewel-toned colours reflected in our new box. His wife, Lady Elizabeth Wardle, founded the Leek Embroidery Society, working on artistic needlework projects with Tusso silk. Nirol, through its blend of rich raw materials, is an ode to this quietly forceful silk ambassador. Maybe that's why I was thinking of fabric. That Maybe the iris actually is conveying a little bit of the coolness of silk. I always think of silk as being quite a cool material. I don't know this particular variety of, of, of silk that they're talking about in the press release. 
The perfume opens with iris, tea and liqueur notes, weaving an intricate pattern with floral notes and spices akin to the textural delight of a piece of tusser silk and symbolising a unique relationship between two countries linked by a common heritage. Do you know what? I'm buying it. I'm, I'm quite happy to... Yeah, it, it does stand up to it because because it's colourful. Neil um perfumes reflect just the beautiful, vibrant colours of India and yeah, I, I would be happy to go along with this as a, as a sort of reflection of of the colours of gorgeous silks and gorgeous fabrics. Uh, so very quickly the notes list says iris, pink pepper, tea, turkish rose, um, angelica, ombrette, cardamom, leather, magnolia, sandalwood, etc, etc. But, but apart from the iris that is just pushed forward a little bit, the rest is is um, pretty much in keeping with a Okay, there's there's a, there's a picture here. I'm guessing. Now let's see if this is going to work. If I can show you this, I'm guessing the distinguished Victorian-looking gentleman is the chap that I've just been reading to you about, and then that must be the silk there, which I have always just thought of as raw silk. So I I guess that is what it is. An Indian raw silk is is just beautiful. It, it's 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 got a curiously sort of pliable texture. Sometimes it does what you want it to do. Sometimes it doesn't. It, it really very much seems to have a life of its own. So we shall see how this one develops. I keep wanting to go back to it. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me uh, for the 13th episode. Oh, look, I messed everything up on my tablet, which means I need to go back to find myself again and make sure I haven't missed any comments. Are we back? Yes, I'm back. Did I miss any hellos? I hope I didn't, because this is this is something that happens. I've got sort of two screens on the go here, and I hope that if I miss a comment on one screen, then I'll kind of spot it on the other. But thank you very much for uh, joining me on what is a fairly sunny, I don't want to jinx it, Friday evening here in the south of England. Apparently we're getting snow this weekend again. I'm not particularly looking forward to that. If you are enjoying what you're watching, please give me thumbs and thumbs up and hearts and, and all the rest of it. By all means, join in, ask a question, leave a comment. Uh, even if you're not watching, uh, Gladys says, see now, this is annoying because Gladys, your comment has just been chopped off that screen. So I need to look at this. I love these episodes. I feel like I'm attending my favorite class. Oh, thank you very much. Did you know I am actually a teacher? Um, and Jack says, you didn't miss a comment including that one. Thanks very much, Jack. Um, if you are watching after the live broadcast, still do feel free to leave a question because I do my absolute best to answer every single one. And then some of you may be aware as well that a few days after the Facebook live broadcast, I stick these videos on YouTube. So if you are watching on YouTube, thank you very much. Please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please ask any questions. And just very quickly, in case we have got any new viewers out there, in a nutshell, the point of these episodes is that they're a kind of opposite to what I do on my blog. On my blog I publish reviews um, about which I've thought uh, for several days, I go out and I wear the perfumes, I see how they develop from beginning to middle and end, um, and, and I'm able to come to a sort of more, um, this is a big nutshell, I'm able to come to a more considered conclusion about the perfume here, the idea is that I smell things for the first time in front of you, we experience them together, and I give you an instant gut reaction. So, following on from that, I need to say that we must remember that these are first impressions. It does happen oh so often, as we know, that a perfume that we love at the beginning turns out to be quite disappointing at the end, and also vice versa. There are several perfumes out there that don't have very auspicious starts, and yet they become quite interesting as they go along. So. Having said all of that and wrapped up that nutshell and flicked it into the distance, thanks again for joining me. We're going to move on now at the 15 minute mark already um, because I have been restraining myself for days from trying this here. And you may be able to see on your screens that this is the latest release from Frederick Mal. This, by the way, is another new release from Frederick Mal. I'm not going to be smelling it now, but I just thought I'd mention it to you. It is a portrait of a lady hair mist, to which I, the only thing I can add is it is a portrait of a lady 
hair mist. You have been told, you have been warned. Um, Portrait of a Lady fans, of which I am one, um, there is now a hair mist. Okay, the new uh, proper perfume from Frederick Mal is this thing here called Music for a While. As I'm opening it, can I just say, I have my doubts about this name. Um, I, I don't know whether, whether it's just me, whether this is a very, very personal idiosyncratic thing, but I quite like the idea of the name of a perfume f flowing well if somebody says to you, what are you wearing? So, you know, what are you wearing? Poison. That kind of works quite well. What are you wearing? I don't know. What are you wearing? Declaration. What are you wearing? Music for a while. I, I get that it's, that it's named after a Purcell song, but you know, what are you wearing? Music for a while. Then I might wear some architecture and then perhaps some embroidery. I don't, I don't know, what, what do you think? I know a few people out there actually do love the name. I, I thought the name would turn out to be one of the most controversial things about this release with people really, really going down heavy saying they don't like it. Um, not, not my favorite Frederick Mal name um, for a brand that actually, Ross says the name grinds. Yes, it does. It's, you know, what are you wearing, music? for a while. Oh, don't you want to wear it for the whole day? No, it's all right, I'll just wear it for a while. What? Um, and Frederick Mal's names are often really, really good. Uh, well, Portrait of a Lady, it's quite a brave name, but it actually works. Uh, Geranium pour Monsieur, uh, Iris Poudre, Mousse Gravageur. Um, but, uh, I'm just gonna write music here, because that'll remind me what it is. I have been restraining myself from smelling this. Uh, the, the arrival of a new Frederick Mal is always very, very exciting. Um, I've, got, I've got high hopes for this one. I get really, really nervous when I smell things for the first time. Can you tell? I should just spray it and get on with it. I have got high hopes for this one, particularly as I really wasn't terribly fond of the last one. The last one is a more of a kind of limited dis limited distribution one for the brand. It's, in, it's one in the kind of Arabic range. It's got an, an Arabic name which translates as Promise, or The Promise. It was made by Dominique Ropion. And I thought that one was a very, very rare misfire for the brand. Um, if, if any of you have tried it, I would be very interested in hearing what you've got to say about that one. So, I'm really hoping this is good. Uh, it's by Carlos Benaim, veteran, veteran perfumer. He's already made Eau de Magnolia for the brand, which is just beautiful. A really, really beautiful homage to a sort of 1970s style uh, sheep. Uh, Jin Hui, I'm really sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Is that right, Jin Hui? Um, you hated that one. I guess you mean you hated Promise. Yeah, it was, that was that was hard work, wasn't it, Promise? All I know about this one, and I couldn't stop myself from finding out this bit of information, is that it is meant to be a kind of attempt to revisit lavender, which is why I've got Pour un homme de Caron here, because that's my sort of reference beautiful lavender, um, just for inspiration, not for empathy, plus I like the bottle. Right, music for a while from Carlos Benaim. Please let this be good, please, please, please. And by the way, I, I did already see from the packaging that this is concentrated as a parfum. Um, and I don't know whether that makes it a first for Frederick Mal actually stating on, on the packaging that, that something is a parfum. I know that Portrait of a Lady is, is dosed quite heavily, and yet I think it's still sold as an eau de parfum. I wonder if that's a kind of Estée Lauder decision there. Okay. This is strange. Right, definitely lavender, no question about it, coming through. So when we say lavender, you know, it's, it's kind of partly camphoraceous, partly sweet, very definitely floral. You know, we, we kind of keep forgetting that lavender is, is actually a, a flower as well, as well as being counted as a herb. And, and yes, the, the lavender connection here is clear with something like Pour un homme de Caron, but 
there's a kind of really acidic, sharp, tart, acidic fruit note. Uh, Alison, I need to look at it because uh, your comments chopped off as well. I don't know. Alison says, it's a miracle that by the end of the Facebook live session, you have not suffocated yourself in perfumes, both delectable and horrifying from all the spraying. Well, what makes you think I haven't? Thrilled you're on to share your thoughts and wisdom. Well, I am thrilled to be here and thank you very much for your comment. I really do appreciate that. The comments do mean a lot to me, by the way, because I sometimes sit here thinking, okay, is anybody actually listening to this thing? But Okay, it is unlike anything I have smelled for a long time. So, so top marks to uh, to Monsieur Mal and Carlos Benayim for creating something that comes across as quite original. And there's something about the tart fruitiness that reminds me of the opening of another uh, Frederick Mal perfume made by Sophia Groisman, Outrageous, which kind of has a, a cocktail-y, apple -y sort of... It's that kind of fruit. It's not citrus fruit, I don't think. It is curious. I'm, I'm more intrigued than than enamoured. Um, I would be very fascinated to know what it would do on skin. And there is unquestionably a sweetness. I mean, the the, the lavender is definitely being presented in a. In a, in a kind of caramelized way. Uh, another superb lavender perfume, uh, Kiki from Vero Profumo, made by Vero Kern, also does that caramelized lavender thing just, just beautifully, wonderfully. It can be, Aglia says, it's pineapple. Well, you're not supposed to tell me, wait till I read the thing. Is it pineapple? Okay, is it thank you very much. Um, yeah, yes, I'd go with pineapple. Um, and yeah, I suppose pi pineapple does have a kind of acidic, you know, you, if, if you had like a mouth ulcer, you really wouldn't want to eat pineapple, would you? But I wonder if that's going to fade. I wonder if the tab, uh, the, I was gonna say, I wonder if the tapenade is good. I wonder if the pineapple, um, Aglia, you stole his thunder. Don't you start fighting now, Alison and Aglia. It's fine. I want you to join in. It's okay. Mind you, what if it's not pineapple? What if it's a wind-up? What if it's actually going to turn out to be, I don't know, kiwi fruit or so? Because you could say anything you like and I would believe you. Um, it could be kiwi. It's got, it's got a kind of acidic feel to it too. Strange. Strange. And I'm not hearing much music either. Um, the, the lavender kind of gives it a, a vintage feel. If any of you remember Boy, for instance, from Chanel's Exclusive, an overdose of lavender at the moment, we don't seem to be able to get away from an overdose of lavender as, as coming across as anything other than vintage, retro. So maybe this is what Frederick Mal is trying to do here. Because I imagine him setting himself little challenges, setting himself little tasks when he creates a new perfume. I could imagine him thinking, let's take lavender and let's make it not feel vintage anymore. And so maybe in his discussions with Carlos Benaim, they thought, okay, perhaps one way we could do that is by contrasting it with really, really sharp fruit. And that might work. Um, actually, let's let's read the press release because this is, it, it it's, it's an original so far, it's definitely original. So, press release is very short. Frederick Mal press releases tend to be um, quite short and to the point. And usually the blurb, is there a blurb actually here? No, the blurbs are different. So, so we, we get to read two things. So let's read the press release one first. Over the years and through many a trial, Carlos Benaim and Frederick Mal's working relationship has developed into one of great professional intimacy. For Benaim, who is celebrating his 50th anniversary at IFF, a, a big global fragrance production company, it's a, collabor sorry, it's a collaboration that only enhances his extraordinary legacy. Their latest creation, Music for a While, follows Eau de Magnolia with an oriental scent, lavender enriched with patchouli, amber and vanilla, as well as a trace of musk, the main ingredients have an effect so precise that any additional softening would be unnecessary. 
The almost classic structure defies expectations with overdoses of patchouli, lavender and ethyl maltol, which is this kind of sweet burnt substance that gives uh, Mugler's angel its, its key identity, um, ethyl maltol, along with a magnetic unexpected hint of pineapple. I'll go with unexpected. Jury's out on magnetic. Um, although, of course, magnets repel as much as they attract sometimes. No, do you know what? Just then, it's starting to become more interesting. It, it is interesting because it's both sort of... It, it's, doing, it's doing that fine balancing act thing at the moment. You could imagine it working like a kind of refreshing summer, summery lavender, like pour un homme de caron, but there is definitely a kind of richness in the depth, maybe from things like the vanilla and the ethyl maltol, that, 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 that makes you understand what they mean when they say it's an oriental and, and that it might work um, in a less outdoorsy sort of setting. A nod to the indulgence of Helmut Newton's work, a scent that incites and rouses, stimulates and inspires. A paradox by its very nature, Okay, yeah, I, it, it, it is paradoxical. As a kind of olfactory expression of a paradox, it works well. A music for a while is ambivalent, yet elegant. A provocative olfactory aesthetic with a name of myriad interpretations. <laughs> okay. Music for a while, a fragrance unbound by the sum of its parts that's, that lifts us up like an eternal melody. Music for a while, a sweet, madly addictive drug composed over time, like a song that swells with seductive power. Music for a while, a fragrance as classic as Henry Purcell's very composition, from whence the name. Notes to copywriter, when you say whence, you don't need to say from. Yet deeply contemporary, like every one of Carlos Benayim's creations. Um, yeah, I'd go along with that. Frederick Mal press releases are usually spot on, and, and they don't try to pull the wool over your eyes. And 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 this press release is basically saying, look, this perfume is a little bit strange, and you may need to work with it. It it is paradoxical, it is surprising, um, and it is getting better. It's not retro, in that full on. Um, seriously challenging, scene-stealing way that Superstitious was was retro uh, a few months ago. Let me just see what it says on the back of the box, because you will know um, what's Alison saying. Perfume copywriters have truly missed their calling as writers for fairy tale houses and, and, and dictators. <laughs> Two writing gigs for which hyperbole can only be applauded. <laughs> Thank you for making me laugh, Alison. Um, I wonder if I wonder if you know, the brothers Grimm ever considered writing for dictators. Um, actually, why am I putting that away? You distracted me. Right. Um, uh, here we go. Irresistible allure. At a party on Paris's Rive Gauche, a woman's fur coat. Is it real fur though? A woman's fur coat is lifted from her bare shoulders, maybe it's a robbery, exposing her neck to the candlelight. This could be the scene for a murder. Hang on, aware of many eyes upon her, or maybe a scene out of Eyes Wide Shut, she pauses, smiling to herself before emerging like a conqueror from the shadows. A sensuous body of lavender is warmed by patchouli, amber and vanilla, so that's what we got from the press release, and transformed by notes of pineapple and mandarin mentioned here. The music is in the detail. Um, okay, perhaps it doesn't reveal quite as much as some of the other Frederick Mal blurbs may have done. Um, but this deserves some time. It's, it's, it is curious. It is curious. It is genuinely trying to do something new, I think, and, and that should always be applauded. Okay, moving swiftly on. At the 30 minute mark, there is another one that I've been very much looking forward to, but I haven't had to restrain myself for quite so long with it because I received it, I think, maybe on Wednesday, yeah, just a couple of days ago, and it's this. A new one from uh, Francis Cochillon. 
from his eponymous brand. Now, those of you who follow my blog and read my blog, and if you do, thank you very much, you may be aware that I'm a massive fan of his original Oud, which came out now quite a few years ago. Um, I was very, very excited about the arrival of this Oud. I put it on my guide to the best Oud perfumes on my blog because, and this is going back to what we were saying earlier when I was talking about Nero, this was one of those rare examples of really successfully bridging the gap between East and West. It, it took Oud, it presented Oud in a respectful way, um, in a considered way, and yet it somehow managed to to, to to offer it up in a very Western sort of European cocktail of, of musks. Um, and you can see I'm kind of like hanging on to the last few drops there because, I mean, I suppose I still have got a fair bit left, but I wore it to death one summer um, and it worked beautifully actually as a summer scent. Um, but I kind of want to preserve these last few drops for when I you know, might really, really need them. But now, Monsieur Curgion has given us an extra version. So um, perhaps, not, not just a more concentrated version, knowing him, he will have revisited the formula and made it perhaps more extra worthy. So he, he would have rebalanced some of the elements, maybe um, pumped up the base. Um, I, I don't actually know. And I suspect I'm not going to find out what he did just yet because I couldn't even really find particularly any press information about this. I, I didn't receive any press information. Uh, Alain says, Curgion's Oud has such a beautiful saffron note. Yes, yeah, you're right. I mean, I don't particularly think of it as a saffron perfume, but you are right. It's got that beautiful spicy dryness. Um, saffron always makes me think of dry steam, if, if, if such a thing is possible, because obviously steam by its very nature is... Is, is humid um, and I'm really really ex excited that he's given us this extra and I'm hoping I'm gonna like it but if I don't I've still got the original Oud always fantastic packaging from from this brand from MFK um, I think he understands the, the the ritual of opening things you've got different layers of packaging so you've, you've got the outer box here which is, which is specific to this perfume because it's got the name. But then you put that aside and you have, in stark contrast to what's come before, you know, uh, because now you suddenly have the minimalism of what's come before, uh, a kind of standard box, but then you pull it out and, and you have a reveal. And, and it's all very, very well thought out. I like his, um, I like his bottles, I like his caps, even though I'm not a packaging freak. Um, there's a message in here, and I wonder if I wonder if actually this is where I'm going to find out about this perfume, but probably not. Well, let's have a look. Uh, in a second. While I'm writing this, by the way, thank you very much to everybody who's tuning in, who has tuned in. Please, please, please give me thumbs up and hearts. Leave a comment, ask a question, that is what I'm here for. And if you're watching this after the live broadcast, thank you very much, leave a comment. And if you're watching on YouTube as well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, this is episode 13 of Love at First Scent with me, Persilaise, and we are just about to smell the new extra version of uh, Francis Cochillon's Oud. I wonder how many people completely switched off and turned away when I said Oud. Because a lot of us are sick of Oud. I'm not sick of it, I'm just sick of bad ouds. Um, oh, this is interesting, because the label looks as though it's... There was me going on and on about the amazing packaging. So that's, that's sort of on the bottle, but this is like a kind of sticker thing. And it doesn't look as though it's going to last very long. Never mind, okay. Right, oud extra. And, and I'm really, really sorry, but I know that paper is probably the worst format on which to try an extra, but I can't go spraying on skin either at the moment, otherwise I'd be completely covered in stuff. <sighs> Thank you, I think this is going to be a good one. Um, That's my stomach growling, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, because my mic is right next to my stomach, if you can hear that. Okay, 
immediately recognizable as Kergeon's oud in the sense that it's it's got the it's got the I was going to say smokiness, and I do mean smokiness, but it's like this kind of puff of smoke. It's like an explosion. You know when Nightcrawler from the X-Men <laughs> teleports and does this with, with brimstone? I always imagined Kelsian's oud um, as doing that kind of thing, just going and surrounding you in this puff of oud. Belinda's left a comment. I love oud, but they need to say something you... Yeah, they do. They do. Uh, completely agree with you, but 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 you would probably agree as well that you could say that about just about all genres of perfumery. I was actually writing the other day a blog post that will probably come out in the next few weeks uh, about gourmand perfumes um, and how I, I I don't have anything against gourmand per se because I think it can be done well. We just get bored of seeing the same thing again and again and again. And this was one gourmand that I was writing about that I actually thought was quite interesting. If you want a smell of sweets. And yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, most ouds, you know, just just make you want to hang your head and cry with with a despair. But when Curgion's oud came out, I think it did do something different. Oh, I'm, th this is beautiful so far. Really, really beautiful. Haven't we done well today? We, we had Niral, which I need to go and smell in a sec again, which was just had the most gorgeous opulent opening. The Frederick Mauer was interesting uh, and this is... Okay so what's he done? I haven't worn um, the the original Oud for a while and, I, and I'm not going to do a side-by-side -side comparison with it now because that might just get too confusing but from memory I would say he's made the opening more peppery, somehow sharper but he's also made the base more substantial. May maybe in terms of its woods, it's all. It's almost like, it's almost like maybe he's made the whole thing drier. Um, a question from Alison, and forgive me for constantly picking up my tablet, but but the the screen in front of me there seems to keep chopping off your comments. Alison says. Why do you think oud, as opposed to other notes popular to Middle Eastern perfumery, has been pushed so hard? Oud is terrific, but why the exclusion of so many other options? Uh, people are going to think I paid you to ask that, because that kind of relates to something I want to talk about a little bit later on. But maybe the simplest answer would be because it's expensive, and then you can push this idea that you're making these perfumes um, for which you can justifiably in inverted commas charge insane prices and also it, it it is something that really was unknown in the west you know when you think of a lot of other middle eastern ingredients that they, they have traveled they had traveled so you, you know you think of incense and and myrrh and 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 lots of different woods and lots of florals uh, cardamom which is what i want to mention later they had done that traveling journey already and they had come over but oud really was quite new, it would really was quite genuinely exotic and, and had been undiscovered. Um, so so maybe that's why. Now I said drier but I'm going to change my mind because I'm wondering if there's... I wonder if there's a kind of really really sort of smoky vanilla. So this is... this is the scent of... of holiday, no not holiday decadence, I was going to say holiday decadence, but it, it, it's a particular form of decadence, like a sort of colonial decadence of lying on a beautiful day bed in a room with um, wooden blinds and the sunlight is just kind of streaming through and creating this beautiful pattern on the floor and maybe there's a ceiling fan, you know, a beautiful sort of brass ceiling fan with those with those gorgeous sort of pulls that you used to have. If any of you have seen The English Patient, one of my favourite movies, um, the main characters, Count Olmashi's room in Egypt, which is just a sort of triumph of lighting and set design, this is, this is what it's making me think of. So you can almost kind of hear a call to prayer in the background. It's it's forever sort of sunset in this perfume and everything is kind of languorous you're not you're not exhausted but you're sort of beautifully tired and you're lying back maybe reading a book maybe drinking a glass of black tea 
it, it is very well done and 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 I, I don't have any information on it I would love to I, I just did a screen grab from one thing uh, which I would which is like the sort of brands website blurb it says from the Orient Oud conveys mystery and sensuality from Laos its land of origin it draws purity and refinement this extrait de parfum interpretation is built on a dream of Oud a supremely elegant precious and rare natural ingredient it has wrapped itself in a musk and vanilla accord okay so I, I did wonder about the vanilla that releases a harmony of spicy rich aromas and olfactory treasure born of sand wind and gold um, Wind, yeah, winds, winds, fe wind features a lot actually in English patient. I mean, maybe the, the the whole the whole soundtrack starts with wind blowing through wind chimes, and there is something desert-like and sandy about it, which is maybe my mind was immediately taken to English patient. This is very special, I think, and I will very much look forward to wearing it. Uh, the official notes are saffron again, Allah. LME from the Philippines, Umbretolite, cedar wood, vanilla, patchouli. So, you know, nothing unusual there. But he's just made it, maybe he's made it more sensual. Maybe he's made it more, um, more opulent. Right, time to, where was I? I need to find myself here so that I can keep up with whatever it is that you're saying. I hope I'm back. I think I'm back. Okay. <clears throat> right. Let me just go back to Nirul for a sec, because time is swiftly running out. Oh, now that's really, really beautiful way, but in a completely different way. This is this is glittering lights, and you know you're not in the middle of the desert here. You're in a you're in a sort of sophisticated gathering, and everybody's beautifully turned out. There are people in this one, whereas I think Kirchian's Oud is, is more solitary. You're sort of more isolated, more thoughtful. Nirul is bursting with colours and with vibrancy and with sparkling conversation and and to, and to, to be a bit more concrete, it, it is still very much doing that kind of iris, rose, violet, maybe a touch of orange blossom, I don't know, I mean Nila Vermeer's bouquets are so rich there could be anything in there. But yeah, really, really gorgeous. I won't smell the Frederick Mal again just yet. Let's give that one a bit more time. Now, we have come to the point where I actually am going to do something that I started uh, in the previous episode, in episode 12, because regular viewers will uh, remember that a lot of you said that you would quite like me to smell at least one older scent, something that maybe most of you will have tried, a personal favorite, and I'm going to do that right now and I wonder how many of you will immediately recognize it from the bottle because what I would like to smell is this Beyond Paradise from Estee Lauder uh, now I'm sure tons and tons of you have smelt it so Peggy says vintage scent time the AC <laughs> thank you very much for the excitement and enthusiasm tell me your comments and what you think of Beyond Paradise um, I haven't spelt this for a while. I had to dig this. This this is, you know, an original bottle. Oh, look, the, the reflection on that is really bad. There we go. You can't even get it in this bottle anymore because as far as I'm aware, it is now only available in the sort of standard bottle that Esther Lauder did for some of their um, more iconic, older scents. Although this one doesn't even particularly count as old. Or does it? Is that wishful thinking on my part that it doesn't count as old? I loved this from the moment it came out. I still remember very, very clearly the first time I smelt it um, in a local department store and I just knew I was going to buy it. I thought it was one of the most interesting and sort of refreshing jasmines that I'd smelt for a while. Peggy says, don't know that one though, sorry. Oh no, and you're all excited about the vintage scent, Virginia. Well, you need to try and find it. I mean, uh, well, if you haven't tried this one, at least let me know, Peggy, what your favourite Estee Lauder scent is or whether you, you have a, a favourite Estee Lauder one at all. This was just such a beautiful, uplifting, kind of lung-expanding, mind-expanding jasmine. Uh, Gladys says, Cali Specco, absolutely yes, made by Cali Specco, immensely talented perfumer and released in 2003. But apparently it didn't do that well, which I just... I, I don't understand. It had everything going for it. I mean, I always thought the bottle was great. 
Um, it had an, uh, well, certainly a memorable, eye-catching ad campaign directed by Luc Besson with a soundtrack by um, um, an obscure American singer some of you may have heard of. <clears throat> um, and I just thought it was stunning. I just fell for it completely. And it is still, it is still pretty good stuff, you know. Calice Becker is, um, what's Belinda saying before I wrap it on? I used to wear Beyond Paradise back when it was launched. There you go. I adored it. I think I need to purchase a bottle of this again. Yeah, I'm... I'm not surprised you. I, I thought I thought it was great, and I still think it's one of Estee Lauder's best perfumes ever. You know, as a as a brand. When I interviewed Karen Khoury, uh, who developed so many of the fragrances for the Estee Lauder brand, you'll find that interview a two part interview on my blog. She talked as well about how she 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 loved this particular perfume. Um, it's hard to say why it didn't work. Maybe people didn't like the bottle. There is something about it, admittedly, that, that that's quite 90s, you know? I, I, maybe if it had come five years earlier, it might have been a massive hit in the vein of L'Odyssee, you know, if, if, it, if, if its cleanliness, if its sort of green and um, purity had come just a little bit earlier, maybe it was just a bit too late. Although, I, I mean, I don't think so, because when I smelt it, I, I was, I was bowled over and it very famously also has an accord that Calice Becker made which was supposed to evoke and convey the sense of the the Eden project um, in England so yes it is ostensibly a green translucent beautifully translucent beautifully judged jasmine but there is definitely a bouquet in there of other things as well you, you'll find a whole list of all sorts of florals if you look online uh, honeysuckle, hyacinth, which, which I would agree with, but it, you know, it doesn't have the, the anger of hyacinth. And it's not particularly indolic, which means that it doesn't have that kind of mothball inflection that you get from a lot of um, a jasmine scents. It, it is just, it, it is so much of what it aims to be. So it is like a kind of perfect water droplet. It does have all of these colors in it. So it does seem to kind of refract the light. Do I mean refract? I mean refract, I think. Scientists help me out, physicists. Um, it does seem to have something fantastically Eden-like and paradise-like about it in the sense that it feels tropical. It, this idea of beyond, which is why it's such a great name for it, it, it does feel like it's transporting you, like it's sort of taking you on, on a flight. You do feel like you're kind of soaring with this perfume. You know, I mentioned how with the Nila Vermeer one, with the Niril one, you feel like you're diving into this beautiful pool, whereas this is you're sort of flying over clouds and this gorgeous landscape is, is unfurling beneath you. And it's sweet, but it's not too sweet. It's green, but it's not too green. It's white floral, but it's not too white floral. It, 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 it's, I'm, I'm, I, I, I defy anybody to tell me anything that Kali Specker that's, you know, has made that, that's better than this. Just on so many levels, because it somehow manages to be very, very clear and very direct and very readily legible and comprehensible. And yet there are so many levels to it and so much complexity. I, I, I just love this. Maybe, you know, if I'm being sort of super critical, perhaps, perhaps it hasn't aged well. Perhaps now we would expect our jasmine to actually probably to be a bit sweeter. And I guess maybe that's the influence of all of these gourmands that, 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 that have changed the olfactory landscape. But it is just wonderful. And I'm surprised that not many more people have said that that they know it and that they've worn it. So, uh, time is running out. We are at the 50 minute mark and there's still at least, there's a couple of things I'd like to do. 
Um, let me put this away. Um, a, a, a quick plug for my uh, blog now. I'm not going to talk about this set now, but I'm so excited about it um, that I will just mention it very quickly. You may be aware that Christine Nagel, who is now the in-house perfumer at Hermès, has launched not one, but five new Hermès Um If you'd like to know what they are, I, I, I won't kind of get into it now because there isn't any time. But if you go to Persolaise.com, if you go to my blog, you will find a fairly recent uh, post about them all. The, the post is ostensibly about this Hermès which is called Cardamusque, or I suppose I meant to say Cardamusque. Uh, it's, it's an oil. And the reason why I am so ridiculously excited about it is because apparently I played a role in inspiring Christine Nagel to make it. Um, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, I was the muse and she completely sort of plucked the idea from my head. I was just one step in the journey of her making this perfume because of a conversation that we had years ago in Paris. And it was extremely generous and gracious and kind of her and of Hermès to to acknowledge that and um, you know to, to let me know um, so I'm seriously excited because Peggy says influence <laughs> it was unintentional seriously I was just I was just talking um, uh, where was I yeah one of one of five new Hermesons this is another one of the new ones really really beautiful um, leathery woody scent called Agar Eben. Uh, comment from Alison. Uh, Alison says, I'm so grateful that Christine Nagel has taken over and congratulations on your influence over such a formidable house. Okay, I mean, influence is probably going a bit too far. I said something, she kind of thought, oh, that's a good idea. But but yes, okay, let, let's go. I'll, I'll take influence. Let's go with influence. And Anne says, got here just in time. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget, obviously, after after this broadcast is over, it'll be on <clears throat> Facebook for as long as Facebook is around, and then it'll be on YouTube. So if you've missed anything, you can always go back. Now, as though that weren't enough, I've also actually influenced another MS perfume. Sorry, I can... And that is the upcoming addition to their um, Cologne range. So their new... Eau de Citron Noir, which I think is coming out in a few weeks, I actually had, um, I don't want to say a more tangible influence, but there was, a, there was a kind of more concrete way in which I influenced it, but I won't tell you about that now because maybe I'll write about it or maybe I might be fortunate enough to get a sample of it and I can tell you all about that. So this is my mention of my blog for today. Please go to persolaise.com. Please look up the review for Cardin Musque. It, it, it's only a couple of posts down and you will hear the sort of very brief story of how I am connected to this scent. And so now at the 52 minute mark, oh, question from Alison or comment from Alison. Alison says, I just received a bottle of vintage 24 Faubourg ah, in the mail yesterday. And is it good? Perhaps Ms. Nagel can revive the house from the last few years minimalist fetish. <laughs> well, there's a lot of people who'd agree with you there, but but you know, I liked Jean-Claude Elena's work. Um, and Jinhee says, congrats on the eighth anniversary. Thank you very much. So does that mean that you went straight to my blog? Because yes, last Sunday was the eighth anniversary of Persolaise.com. I cannot quite believe it. But yeah, that blog is over eight years old now. I like Jean-Claude Elena's work. Um, I had a lot of time for his stuff. Um, I thought, for example, his Cuir d'Ange for the Hermesence was really not all that minimalist. It was quite an uncharacteristically um, muscular leather for him um, but yes a lot of people are very very pleased that the replacement is Christine Nagel because I guess what they're going to I think what people are hoping is that she's going to bring a kind of sensuality which maybe was lacking a little bit in Elena's work he last time I saw him actually at the launch of Le Jardin de Monsieur Lee he said that he sort of identified with, you know, if he had to kind of present himself as a sort of him and Christine Nagel as feminine archetypes, then he would probably be or he would be more interested in the Hitchcock blonde. For him, Kim Novak was the sort of ideal. Whereas he said that he thinks that Christine Nagel is somebody like Monica Bellucci. And actually, I, I think he's spot on. I think she kind of brings an Italian sensuality to the brand. Um, and she's not afraid of making her more feminine sense, more overtly feminine. Anyway, enough rabbiting from me. 
Nobody has kind of expressed a particular interest on what they would like to smell. But there is something else that I would be I'm very interested to try, and I promise I will try and keep this to under an hour, and we're approaching 55 minutes, is these two little guys here. Um, a, a brand, super independent, super niche brand that hopefully some of you are aware of, but many of you may not be aware of, called uh, Jasmine Sarai. They've just gone through uh, a relaunch. They were founded, or the brand was founded, by a trained perfumer called Dana El Masri. Uh, Smaranda says, oh, I missed it. Are we talking about Hermes? Yes, we were just talking about Hermes. We're now talking about Jasmine Sarai. Founded by Dana El Masri. Um, if you go to persolays.com and you look up the name of the brand, you in my reviews section, you will see what I've thought of some of the other scents. The, the, the concept for the brand is that every single perfume is linked to a specific song and the founder the creator of the perfumes actually invites you to listen to the songs while you smell the perfumes um, when you if you go to their site you, you, you've got links to you know literally be able to sit and listen to the songs now I'm not going to do that now because I think that might be a bit too confusing but they've just had a brand um, relaunch and they've got two new perfumes one is called and, you know, I needed to apologize for messing up French before, but Dana, if you're watching, I'm going to completely butcher because I don't speak Arabic. You wouldn't have thought I grew up in the Middle East. One is called Nar and one is called Maare. Is that right? Because you put there's an accent after this, so we'll go with Maare. Sorry if it's not. And I'm, I'm just going to go with Nar for today. And this is really nerve wracking as well because I really like this brand and I hope I like these perfumes by a really really freaky coincidence which I wrote about on my blog a few years ago it turns out that Dana El Masri and I at one point actually had the same English teacher not at the same time because she's considerably younger than me um, but yeah we when when she contacted me about her brand we were just sort of talking about where we lived and it turned out she lived in Dubai as well so you know next question was oh what school did you go to? And oh, I knew somebody who worked at that school. And then turned out we had the same English teacher. So the world is very, very, very small. And she is now based in Canada, not the English teacher, Dana El Masri. So this is Nar from Jasmine Sarai. The last thing that I'm going to smell very, very quickly now on episode 13 of Love at First Scent. Hearts and thumbs up, people. You haven't given me any for a while. And I'm feeling all forlorn and rejected and upset. Unless, of course, you want me to think that I, you hate me. Um... And if you're watching on YouTube, please give me a thumbs up and leave a comment or ask a question. Yes, there you go. Heart's coming on my screen now. Thank you very much. Nar from Jasmine Sarai. Ooh. This is, this is going to be one of those bonfire perfumes. For which I am a sucker. Um, have any of you tried Bois d'Assez? from um from 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 Naomi Goodsir. <laughs> that that is like a kind of ultimate bonfire scent for me and this is this is doing that you know throw another log on the fire things are burning you can hear the crackling the the sort of beautiful touch of smoke is filling the air but there is a contrast i think with a kind of sense of Sweetness, maybe? It's, it's kind of burning and smouldering, but it's also tender at the same time. It feels quite affectionate. Thank you to whoever's going crazy with the hearts, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've taken my request to heart. And there's a sense of spiciness. It's not, it's not miles away from the Curgion oud maybe because of maybe there's some lme in it you know that kind of hot wood so yeah great start time is pressing it we are almost at the hour mark i just did uh before we started i did a screen grab of what the brand website says about this so here we go from the heart of cairo another mention for egypt um uh, what was the other mention? I've gone black. Yes, English patient is a mention of Egypt. From the heart of Cairo emanates a halo on a cool December evening. Hafez gets up on stage and asks, what does the bride want to hear? Your love is fire, she answers. So there's the song. 
Um, Gladys says, this house has been on my list to try. Neon Graffiti, I think, is one. Check, check it out on my blog. And yes, do, do check out the brand. Well worth your time. Um, your love is fire, she answers. Embers of love and longing. Love burns, ignites. It's passionate flame forging two into one, for good or bad, in sickness and in health. Made with just five ingredients, this perfume tells the tale of my grandparents' wedding night. Oh, wow, okay. That's very, very touching. So, and we must find out what else the grandparents may have told Dana about the way. And their inextinguishable love. Nostalgic and linear, it evokes repetition and the sweet song which Hafez sings. And the song to which there is a link, a kind of what looks like a Spotify link on the website, is Your Love is Fire. I am not going to try and say it in Arabic. Is it Hibbik Na? Hibbik? So I suppose Nar, I guess Nar is fire then. Okay, so yeah, so you've made a perfume called fire. Um, and the notes are coriander. Okay, yeah, 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 yes, I'm, yeah, now that, now that I've read it, definitely that kind of woody, sp spicy feel. Cedar wood, guayac wood, and burning embers. So it's woody through and through, but I wonder what it is that's making me think that, you know, we've got a contrast, because Because it doesn't have that somewhat off-putting super dryness that you get from some perfumes that are just kind of uninteresting cedar perfumes. So yes, very quick roundup then. Uh, if you have any final comments, please make them now because I'm about to switch off. Let's just quickly go back to Niril from Nila Vermeer. It's just this vision of shimmering elegance. Really, really good. By the way, regular viewers will know that after a few hours, I post a kind of update on Facebook. Uh, on, on the, oh, I leave a comment after the video to say how the blotters have done with the passage of time, because that is also interesting. So Nero definitely resounding thumbs up. And then, yeah, let's see what the Frederick Mal is doing now. <laughs> it's strange. That pineapple note has not gone away. But I'm I'm going to wear this. This I wonder if the pineapple is, is is precisely the kind of thing that actually might get warmed up by skin and become quite interesting. Th this is the the Frederick Mallet has to be said is the most original thing I've smelt today. Uh, Curgeon's oud. Yeah, really, really slow moving. It kind of makes you slow down. We won't bother with Beyond Paradise because. We all know it. Uh, Gladys says, it's much better on skin. Um, I'm guessing you mean the Frederick Mal, right? Yeah, I, I, plus it's an X-tray, it's a parfum, so you know, you, you, you sort of, I want to be fair to it. Perhaps I'll wear it tonight. Um, and oh look, my tablet's been really, really helpful with the comments, so I need to look on her. Gladys says, it's much better on skin. And Ross says, brilliant hour, thanks, well, Thank you for tuning in. I really, really appreciate it. And then very, very quickly, where's the gnar? I'm only just spray that though. Yeah, probably becoming more cedary, but still lots of character. Alain says, thanks for a wonderful episode. Would love to hear your your impressions on, 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 sorry, in the future, on Maître Parfumer and Gantier's Parfum d'Habit. I would have to I would have to find that. I'm guessing it's because you really like it, Alain. Okay, I'd have to try and track it down. Right, boys and girls, thank you very much for tuning in. Have a fantastic weekend. Uh, don't forget to leave questions if you're watching this after the broadcast, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook, and look after yourselves. Thank you very much. Bye.